All righty. Here it goes. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So uh, y'all are in for a treat today. My name is uh, Miguel Martinez Sainz, President of St. Francis College, and I am deeply honored to uh, able to welcome you to this conversation. I want to, before I turn it over to Theo Ganji, the director of our MFA program, I want to thank Ben Schneider and Shaka Kane for being with us. Um, I like to tell folks, I mean, we're in the heart of Brooklyn. Uh, art is incredible. I just finished teaching a philosophy class and one of the things we do, one of the modules is on the art form and how critically important it is for us as human beings to engage the art form. So I appreciate filmmaking, uh, unbelievably so. I, I am delighted that we are part of this. Some of you may know we have a low residency MFA program. Theo Gaines is going to tell you a little bit more about that. But one of the things I want to tell folks, especially young folks that are on the call, the arts are incredibly important. And sometimes we forget that. So I urge you engage, engage, engage in all the art forms that you can. Today you're gonna to hear a couple of powerful conversations about one of the art forms that are uh, critical for our future. Uh, one of the lines I like brother from, uh, from your, your latest film uh, is the idea that you can murder a liberator but you can't murder liberation. And I think of the same context, you can murder an artist but you can't murder, murder art. Right, it's a certain thing that it continues to perpetuate itself. So I appreciate your presence. With that, I give it over to the director of our MFA program, Theo Gansey. Thanks a lot. Hey, uh, President Miguel, thank you uh, so very much. Um, and thanks for you know, making an event like, like we have for you this evening possible. Um, I wanna welcome everyone to uh, to St. Francis College. Uh, this is a Write in Brooklyn event, which is a, a series where we like to bring writers uh, writing about, in, around, thinking about Brooklyn uh, to have interesting conversations and, um, and just demonstrate a little bit of the kinds of you know, conversations and thinking that we do at the MFA program. Uh, we are the only low residency program in New York City. Uh, low res is just uh, a way of, you know, um, uh, running a program where we meet in short intensive sessions uh, for 10 days in January and 10 days in July. And we work with uh, mentors in between. We have uh, tracks in fiction, poetry, uh, and uh, dramatic writing, screenwriting, playwriting. And uh, we also have tracks in uh, graphic novel writing on the way, as well as nonfiction. So if you're interested in that, I'm gonna go ahead and put a link in the chat uh, to the program. So uh, you can check us out uh, at your leisure. Uh, I'm so excited to introduce you uh, to our um, guest tonight. Uh, first, I wanna just uh, introduce Ben Snyder. He's a, uh, a writer, a screenwriter, director, playwright, and a great friend of the program. He's uh, uh, currently a writer producer for HBO's uh, series, Betty. And uh, Ben, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Great. Um, are we able to spotlight? Can we, I see like a million faces. Can we spotlight Shaka um, or Shaka and yeah. I? I do like seeing everybody, but just to know, there we go. Yeah, just leave him there. <laughs> I'll be up here. Oh, never mind. Um, my next guest needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyways. There's like uh, 88 people on this. That's great. Um, let's just, let's just, uh, I don't want to see people. Show of hands uh, to see what work we're familiar with of his. Uh, who's familiar with uh, Newlyweeds? Who's seen Newlyweeds? Anybody? Yes, yes. Fans, fans. Uh, who knows Shaka's television work, writing, directing for shows like Random Acts of Flyness, High Maintenance. Are we familiar with this work? More hands? Hands in the air, good. I'm trying to, if it was live, we could see a sea of hands, but we'll just, we'll have the, the virtual version of this. Who knows, who knows Shaka's short films? Who knows his short films? There's one short film that he wrote, directed, and starred in. I would, I would say it's a perfect short film. Like I, I show it to every student 
Um, I asked Shaka if I could use this word. He said I could. Mulanya, if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's it's incredible. It's a it's a it's a lesson in in short form filmmaking. Um, and who's seen Judas and the Black Messiah? Who's seen it more than once? Who's seen it three times? Lots of hands. Lots of hands. All right. Um, it's not as loud as I'd like it to be, but we're on Zoom. So what can you do? Uh, Shaka, how many of these things have you done? If you had to guess. <clears throat> movies um no no i mean like talks like these public oh i don't know in the I've, last year. i've definitely lost count a lot of them okay a lot uh, of them. i've gotten used to them what was what was the worst experience what was the worst public talk the public the public talks have never been bad great what was um the, what was the best the, the public talks and the one with i did with high school kids these high school kids uh, i believe were in, in albany or Buffalo, it was amazing. It was amazing. Cool. What's what's a question? and another and all the ones done with kids have been amazing, which is why, always why, why, uh, why are those, why kind are of those? shocking. Questions, conversation, questions in the conversation, just like really questions no one else had asked me. Cool. What um and you used to be you used to teach or work with young people. I did, but that. And I, I, I don't even think, cause I, I thought to myself like, oh, is this, you know, fetishizing is the wrong word, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Just, uh, you know, uh, attaching greater meaning to it because it's kids and, and I know they just asked the most interesting, they just were asking questions that no one had asked. Uh, and also they were, were more direct and confrontational about opinions they had that I'd heard, but had never been, you know, I'd read in articles, but no one had ever voiced to me in interviews. Mm -hmm. And I'd always wanted to engage in, I had many thoughts, but because I'm not on social media, I couldn't share them, you know? Um, and so it was an opportunity to like talk about things that I had thoughts about uh, that had never been raised. Is there, is there anything <clears throat> that no one's asked you um, that they should have by now? I don't know. I can't remember. I don't remember probably but, but I, I don't i don't know okay well hopefully we'll have a good conversation i'm going to ask you a few questions and i'm going to open it up and we'll get questions in the chat i think that's the easiest way because then we can just see the order that they come in let's not right. start yet um because calling on people it's always like what's fair mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so, uh, the first the first and, and we're here to talk about you as an artist and celebrate you as an artist not just one piece that you made, but your your catalog of work, we're all excited about. Um, the first film that I saw of yours was Newlyweeds, and I was I was kind of blown away. And it's such a beautiful film and funny and dark and sad and real and like Amari Cheatham. I, and I feel like he's like, I know people know his name now, but I feel like he's one of the like most like under recognized talents out there. Can I say that about him? I completely agree. Um, anyways, beautiful film and so funny. And then, and, and the shorts also, and, and you have a facility with comedy, you have a comedic vibration, just you as an artist. And I'm wondering, uh, if you have any feelings about the use of comedy, how, and when, and why you use comedy as an artist, your philosophy around that. You know, it's funny you asked that question because today I did a, uh, an interview with, with someone who asked me about there's a scene Judas where um, O'Neill finds you know is led to believe that there's a member of the Panthers who is torturing informants in George Sands and the scene ends with Lakeith as O'Neill overselling what he would do to a snitch if he were to catch a snitch and the guy loved this scene interviewer loved this scene and he asked how he found just the you know that moment he was like because if those guys were paying attention you know those those panthers were paying attention looking at you know O'Neill's performance in this moment they would know that he's he's clearly an informant you know just from his sort of broad reaction and I said you know I can't resist sometimes making jokes a good joke I can't resist a good joke uh, because I've just always enjoyed 
making jokes my whole life. And I remember in that scene, look, I was like, I went up to Lakeith. Lakeith is similar. Me and Lakeith, that's, I think, something we share. And so, in fact, I know it is. It's why, I, you know, Lane's, I'm, I'm fond of him. And I m- remember going up to him, I was laughing to myself because I could already see what would be funny to me about this, this, this choice. And I was like, yo, it'd be cool if you just kind of oversold, you know, what you would do, you know, to, to a rat if you caught one. And as I was saying it, Lakey started laughing because he could see what would be funny about it. And then he did it and we just were crying. I mean, it was like the last take and we just were crying tears. I mean, crying tears of laughter. And I was like, it has to go in the movie. I was like, I don't care if it defies the logic of the scene. I was like, because it's a great joke and it's a great, you know, so there's a movie that could use and it, they could use jokes, you know, um, and it's a dark joke and it was just perfect. You know, it was like, and, and I was like, at the end of the day, yes, you know, we're trying to remain as true to the emotional truth as possible, but it's a movie, you know, yeah. and it's supposed to be, if you, if you can make a great joke, it's hard to resist. I think it's a lot easier, you know, it's, it's it, you, you know, as, you know, a, a direct when it's, to make a joke or not. Mm-hmm. you know you know it's distracting when it's not um and so i knew that's but, but at the same time you know i think i think you'd be surprised where humor has its place mm-hmm. you i know you did a lot of work um with the family and you did a lot of research and i'm wondering um for for judas and the black messiah uh being actively engaged with the family, actively engaged with the history. Then there's the politics of that period and your personal politics. And then there's the piece of you that's the entertainer and needs to make something that is dynamic and engaging. Who leads when you're developing the film? Which, because these are competing interests sometimes. No, you know, at different points, different people lead, you know. Um, you know, different points you wear different hats. I'm able to compartmentalize pretty effectively in general. Mm-hmm. So I think it, it lends itself to having to juggle so many different um, uh, viewpoints and desires. Um, but, you know, it, it's all, it all depends on the, on the moment. Now making films that invite conversation, that invite audiences to do more research, to learn more, um, social impact films, what is, what is the metrics for something like that? How do you measure the impact of the piece of art that you made? That's a great question. And I don't know that I have the answer, especially because the probably, you know, look, I mean, this is really the first thing I've made that people have really seen in a real way. Um, and it's not like, theaters were open and there was a box office to track um, for me to have a clear sense of how impactful the movie's been. Mm-hmm. You know, I have some metrics. I've had some different things that told me it's been pretty impactful. You know, I mean, one thing was a friend of mine sent me uh, some kind of Google Analytics still shot that he took where he was able to measure how often someone in Google searched the term COINTELPRO the day before my my movie came out and the day after it came out. And it was like this, the graph, the graphic, you know? That was one that was, that told me, you know, um, this like congressman, you know, brought back some bill to take Jagger, Jagger Hoover's name off of the FBI building, you know, Mm -hmm. as a result of watching the movie, that was another, okay, it's, it's reaching that that group of people, um, you know, other things, you know, so I, I, I can tell that it's been pretty impactful, um, for sure. A, uh, a friend of mine and, and movement elder heard I was going to be talking to you and wanted me to ask a question, which is, are you currently or are you willing to 
use this moment and your platform to help get political prisoners out that are still locked up from this movement? Yeah, it's something that I've talked about a trillion times, you know, I mean, it's something that even in, you know, our work with Participant, who's one of our producing partners, uh, and who runs this, the movie Social Impact Campaign, every time I've ever had a conversation with them, my, they're, they're like, so what do you want to focus on? It's like getting Panthers out of prison and amplifying the fact that many are complete uh, you know remain uh imprisoned in, in exile um yeah. and you know if you recognize like if anybody recognize i mean even you know they was asked to potentially um i guess like do something with that kind of person who wanted to remove jagger Hoover's name from the federal building an fbi building and i was like no, I'm not really that interested now. It's like, but if the, you know they want to do something around getting some of these political prisoners out of prison, I was like, I'm down to engage in that because mm -hmm. I think that that's the only like if you recognize that COINTELPRO um, was illegal and led to you know the murder and incarceration of people who didn't deserve it, and many of those individuals still remain incarcerated as a result of COINTELPRO, then it makes no sense for them to remain incarcerated. If you, if you say, I, I, was, I'm, I believe that a wrong was committed, it's like, it's not, it's, it is too late to uncommit the wrong, but it's not too late to like, let people out of prison. Yeah, and a lot of them have, are struggling with yeah. their health, Mumia. Yeah, they, they get COVID, yeah, Mumia, you know, I mean, you know, soon the other core it's like it's it's a lot you know what i mean um and soon the other rather um and you know i not only are they <clears throat> struggling with their health but there's also the fact that like they just keep getting denied parole yeah after they've you know served two three times their sentence that they were originally sentenced for I mean, the minimum sentence, you know, no issues behaviorally ever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it's a war, it's still a war. Now, I think, I think you and I are around the same age. Um, so we were around the same age when the film Malcolm X came out. Um, and that was, you know, the energy of the early 90s, 1992, Rodney King verdict. Um, and there was a certain energy from the film from the early 90s looking at the 60s and i'm wondering how you as a filmmaker were affected by the history we're living through now looking back um if there were any choices you made intentionally knowing kind of the moment that we're in no not really um because you know remember i shot the movie in 2019 mm -hmm. uh you know and you know, the moment, if by the moment you're in, you're talking about, you know, George Floyd on, you know, we were in post when that happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I mean, the energy we made, you know, the, the sort of quote unquote tightness in the movie, the energy we made the movie with, we made the movie with the energy that, you know, that this has been practice, common practice since prior to the events of the, the, the movies framing mm -hmm. and focusing on. Um, and that, you know, little, you know, substantially remains different. Um, you know, and so we just operated from that framework. Mm -hmm. Do you do you feel like you're part of a movement of filmmakers? Do you have contemporaries that you're like, we're, we're doing something? And, and what would you say characterizes the movement you might be part of artistically at this time? I think, it, I think movement implies more organization than mm -hmm. what exists amongst the community I feel like I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's a sort of very unofficial community of Black filmmakers who are in communication, who, you know, rely upon one another for advice, for notes, for, you know, connection, for, uh, therapy in instances mm -hmm. um yeah 
All right. Um, I'm going to open up the, the line and, and see what uh, the good people want to ask you. Uh, let's see. Um, any questions, feel, feel free to throw into the chat. I'm seeing resources, um, but I don't see any questions. Does anyone have any questions? There's hands, but anything in the chat? For Shaka. Uh, what was your favorite movie to make? Um, Moulin Yans and, and Judas and the Black Messiah. Cool. Uh, any, I mean, uh, there's, you know, a little bird on my shoulder was, was tweeting about Superman, but is there anything you're excited about coming up? I'm, I'm not, I know nothing about Superman. Just, I really don't know anything about Superman. <laughs> Any of your own projects that you're uh, excited about? I am. I'm. I'm. I'm excited to rest, and then I'm excited to get back into some other stuff. But first thing I'm excited for is just to rest. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to young filmmakers? Um. Well, I mean, I think just never stop. I mean, it's a kind of, you know, probably feels like boilerplate ish, not particularly prescriptive advice, but don't stop making movies. Is there, I'm gonna to add to that question. Is there anything that you like would tell your younger self or you wish someone had told you? Uh, I don't know that I ever wish someone had told me anything that I learned later because the way I learned it, um, I think made the lesson a lot more tangible. Mm -hmm. And also probably taught me a lot about myself that I otherwise wouldn't have learned. So I don't know. This. Okay. Uh, someone wants to know if there was anything um, that you learned in preparation for making Judas and the Black Messiah that was shocking to you. About the Black Panthers? Um, I'm guessing. I'm assuming that history, yes. Yeah. Um, I was, I mean, it's, it's, I was shocked to learn that Wayne O'Neill wasn't Fred Hampton's bodyguard, mm -hmm. which is what I'd read in so many texts. Uh, to discover that he was not his bodyguard was really surprising. I and mean, we had to like change our pre the premise of our idea to a large degree when we learned that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, someone wants to know uh, if you have any future political projects. Mm. As in movies that are, have a politic to them? Yeah. I do have I do have one that I'm thinking of, yeah. You want to talk about it? I can't. Okay. Um, how do you, what's, how do you, how do you approach casting? Um, how did you kind of approach casting the leads of Judas? Totally intuitive. Um, you know, I, I actually am a person who I, I don't borderline have to, at a certain point, I have to see a, an actor in the role in order to write, the, to, write the, to write it. So I fortunately saw the, my, you know, our four leads in Daniel Keith, Jeff, and Dominique. I saw them in the roles when I was writing it and was lucky enough. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, someone wants to know why you're not on social media. I mean, it doesn't, uh, A, I don't think it fits my personality um, to share everything at all. I think it's hard enough. I, you know, having to go through the process of selling the movie, um, that's far more engagement than I'm doing you know, have with people, I'm very tired. So I can't imagine having to engage with people that frequently. Um, and also there comes a bit of a pressurized situation, I feel like to, you know, entertain, say stuff that's witty and clever and funny, especially the person who, you know, just is a part of my natural way of communicating. There's also a possibility of saying the wrong thing and offending somebody and then finding yourself in and then ruining your career. <laughs> I don't need any of that in my life. And then people just like hate, you know, saying things about you that are hateful 
no one really knows you at all, but thinks that they completely know you. So all of those things, it's like terrible idea. <laughs> it's terrible. I don't know anyone do it. Great. Uh, uh, someone would like to know um, if there was anyone that you really wanted to meet at the Oscars. Uh, if there was anyone that I'd wanted to meet at the Oscars. I wanted to meet. I, mean, I wanted to meet. I mean, it's that was one of the things that was kind of rough about about it is that you know you didn't really get to meet most people because of social distancing. Um, so I didn't really really get to meet a lot of folks, unfortunately. Uh, question: What was the most difficult choice you've had to make during your career? Mm. Wow, what was the most difficult choice I've had to make during my career? Mm. I had to fire someone once. That was hard. Can you tell us more or no? Um, you know, it was on Judas and <clears throat> they're in charge of a department that I didn't have a lot of experience running uh and engaging and you know uh, because of that i wasn't aware of just the time you know sort of the time the way the timetable should be working in terms of how prepared they should be by x date and you know folks who uh, you know i listened to you know my collaborators who were more experienced and were like hey you should be here and you're not there yet and there's a problem here and you know hearing that from multiple people you know and they were like if you think we need to let this person go how do you feel about it i was like i defer to your expertise in this matter and i said but i should be the one to do it because i hired him and so i had to you know, I someone wants to know how they can support you how, how people listening right now can support uh you in helping to free uh panthers that is a great question. I mean, there's a number of, you know, it, it's it's tricky. I think all I've been doing is amplifying uh, just, you know, their names. And I mean, I'm not on social media, but anytime, you know, we got nominated for an, won an award, uh, you know, we just mention their names um, as much as possible. Uh, but, you know, it's it it seems like, you always think kind of monetary uh, ways to assist, but it, it, I haven't found in the people I've spoken with that that's a need lies, you know? Um, it's like writing parole boards. You know, and I don't, it's like, I, I don't, I, honestly, it's, it's, it's one of those situations where I, you know, I don't, the people feel, need to sort of feel the pressure to release them, don't. Um, and yeah, all, all, I mean, I think the only way to do it is sort of amplify their names enough that they're still frustrated legally. I would I would plug the organization RAP, um, release aging people in prison. They're doing a lot of important work to get elders out and get them home, and also the Free Them All campaign. Um, there was a set. There was a follow up question. Um, about how you felt about the Oscars, were you um, not impressed as you as you, watching the Oscars? Not impressed. Were you as not impressed as you looked at the Oscars? I don't know. I looked unimpressed. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, okay. Are, do we, if they offered you Superman, would you take it? I have no idea. Okay. I haven't read the script. <laughs> I'm just reading in the chat. Um, why are you not asking my first question in the second chat? <laughs> Sorry, Shiraz. Let me, let, me, let me go back and look. Uh, my question is, why do filmmakers not make movies and documentaries with elders and grandparents, grandchildren, friendship in Africa and North America? You, re you read all of the questions, then. 
I should, should I be should I be editing now? <laughs> generous of you. I just don't even know what that question is. I can I can talk. Can I talk? Oh, you you could you could, talk, you could talk very briefly, but I want to get to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. No, I I have created grandparents grandchildren friendship to increase the visibility of elders' story and grandparents' uh, story. So I've never found any film with elders uh, in Africa. And then there are very few made in North America, especially stories of African-Americans and so on. So do you know why filmmakers are not making movies? Uh, the African film I found was called First Grader. But uh, okay, that's my question. I think it's clear, yeah, right? Got it. So why people don't make movies of elders in the United States, particularly black filmmakers you're asking? I think that, I think, well, I think independently, there are probably a number of movies made about elders. I, I mean, I feel like I have, I just know that there are. I think that in, you don't see a lot uh, in certain terms of like major motion pictures because um, there aren't many elderly actors who are going to get you to a budget at which studio movies are made. Um, the same way that, you know, there's a sort of a dearth of young black actors, like incredibly young. I mean, I ran into this when people would ask like, you know, beyond casting Daniel because he was the only person who came to mind immediately. And it was an intuitive choice to cast him and know that he also was one of the most talented actors on the planet. I didn't even think to myself, let me cast a black actor who is 20 or 21 years old to play the role of Fred Hampton because there wasn't one who could get, who I could bring to a studio to get me $30 million. And the same goes for elderly actors. You know, think about your sort of elderly black actors. It's Morgan Freeman who you don't see doing as much work anymore um, and not certainly not leading, being the lead in material. Um, and then, you know, Sam Jackson, you know? Fair enough. Like not a lot of, <laughs> you know, so Somebody I think that's probably why. Thank you very much. Yeah? Thank, Thank you. you. Someone wants to know, uh, will you mentor me? Not me, I'm asking for them. Maybe. Okay. What That's do they cool. want me, yeah, maybe. We'll get more information. Yeah. Uh, this is a kind of a repeated casting question and a question from Tavi. Hasha yes. to the king. Love, I love it, her. bro. What would you say is your biggest challenge to losing your anonymity when it comes to doing and being present with your art? Um, I haven't. I don't think I've lost my anonymity. You still think you can blend in a crowd? Pretty much, I think so. Yeah, okay. I'm not in front of the camera. I'm behind. I'm behind the camera. It's different. Um, what are your favorite movies? Um, what do you want us to I watch? A, I have so many. I'm gonna think about. Let me look at a list. I'm thinking about, I mean, I mean, I have so many favorite movies. It's, it's, if you have a list handy, could you throw it in the chat? Yeah, for yeah, I'll do that. Drop it in the chat. I have a list, I'll have a list of movies that I um, watched when I was talking about Judas. Cool, we'll, we'll take it. Okay. Uh, yeah. There might be some repeats on here because it's from my notes, but, you know, pardon me. Now people are te texting me that I'm not asking their question. Um, oh, and then I added, yeah, I just, there's weird notes in there too. <laughs> uh, when, uh, I forgot, person who just texted me, can you remind me of your question? Sorry, I'm, I'm just reading a million questions. When going into a new project, does it ever become introspective in the end? Does it start to be about you and working something out for yourself? I think it. I think it inevitably always is. I think it inevitably always is. Definitely, absolutely, absolutely. 
is it is there a part of your work that you're accessing kind of spiritual emotional places within yourself that's another question definitely uh, of course absolutely if i'm doing if i'm if i'm actually making i've never had the experience of not doing that unless it was a job for hire like directing tv but something that i wrote and directed produced a thousand percent do you have a specific process um, when you're approaching writing a, a feature film? And if so, could you kind of break it down? Um, I mean, the first thing I do, it, it, it's, there's a long notes process of just sitting in a chair for hours and ideas coming to me and when they stop coming to me, reading something that's around the subject that I'm writing and then letting, you know, highlighting things that I think are interesting and generating more ideas. And then eventually I get to a place where uh, I start breaking down the characters, uh, physiology, psychology, and sociology. And, and, and then it's asking myself some questions, a series of questions, and then answering those questions until I feel comfortable enough to start writing because I'm dying, usually I'm, eventually I get to a place where I'm just dying to start writing the thing. And then, you know, that, that, that I mean, it's, it's, you know, it was different with Judas because I had, it was the first time I had a co-writer. And so I'd done all that work, even though it was, you know, for people who existed. Uh, and, and I was able to answer those questions, you know, by going through the historical record. Um, but then, we outlined the script. We first put it on cards and then we did a more detailed outline and then Will did the first draft. Mm -hmm. And and then I refined and then I just rewrote it. And then just rewrote it, rewrote it, rewrote it, and then exchange scenes. What what directors are you most inspired by, either contemporary or from any time period? So many. I mean, you know, Bong Joon Ho is, you know, to me the just blows my mind. Uh, Leo Karak blows my mind. Um, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson is amazing. You know, S Spike is amazing. Um, you know, uh, Maddie Rich. What'd you say? Maddie Rich. I, I, I didn't really hear that. Oh, I was saying that Maddie Rich. What you think about Maddie Rich? Maddie Rich. Man, I, I mean, I love Shadow of Brooklyn. The Strata book is a classic. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a million. It's called Martin Scorsese. I always love Martin Scorsese's work, you know. Right. Uh, a question from Misa. Um, what is the process of writing a script collaboratively as you did with Judas? Which do you prefer, collaborative or solo writing? Oh, I'm never going to write a script alone again. Oh. In fact, the next script I do this, I have an idea, I want to do it like Borat too, where there's a writer's room. And, and then it'll be shaped by myself and another writer, but I want, I want a writer's room. I think it's, it's so valuable if you can do it. In, in working with a, a major studio and making a big budget film, um, were there compromises? And if so, would you speak to any of those that you had to make? Inevitably, I think the compromises that you make, you know, not just for the studio, but for, you know, in the case of our film, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. and Colin and Jerry, there were compromises that we had to make in terms of compromising the, uh, you know, entertainment value of the movie. Um, and then there were compromises where we had to compromise I don't know. Did we ever really compromise? I'm sure. Absolutely. The entire existence of the movie is, is, is in many ways comprom compromising of the truth for entertainment value. So it's, a, it's an incredible balance mm -hmm. of compromises. Um, but I think we all, myself, producers, the studio, and the family, we all, we all, we've all come away from this experience saying it was worth every compromise. Um, and that's, that's the best place you can be at. Absolutely. 
um, there's a, a specific ask. People were, were serious about getting Mumia out this year. Um, the question is, would you be willing to link Pam Africa with Charlemagne the God to talk on The Breakfast Club about Mumia? Easily, easily. That's Thank you. Easy. Absolutely. Great. Please do that. I was trying to get you at, at, uh, at the Silver 12 Move Assistance Place on that one. I really need that. Absolutely. If you give me your info. Put in the chat, put in the chat your contact information. Okay, no doubt. I'll do it right now. And and I will reach out to you and I would absolutely do that. Thank you. Um, of course. Um, there's a question. Um, uh, you worked with the family, you worked with Fred Hampton's family. Uh, how did that change your making of the film? I mean, I mean, I, like when I say that, you know, I thought that William O'Neill was Chairman Fred's bodyguard. I thought that until I met Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. Uh, hold on, let me just copy this into my notes, pardon me. Um, and so that was the beginning of, you know, one of many changes that, that occurred uh, in our initial vision of the movie you know, that, that we altered to reflect the actor's truth of, of what has occurred. Um, so, you know, that's one example I can give you a million. Mm -hmm. There's a question about what, it's like, what it was like to work with Daniel and Lakeith, two of the greatest actors. What was that process like for you? Just the, it, it'll, I'll never, probably never have an experience as gratifying again, I, artistically, I, collaboratively. And that's not just with the two of them, that's with the, the entire cast. I have, I have yeah. a specific question around that, actually. Um, I've, I've sometimes worked with actors as a director that I'm like in awe of and, and a big fan of, and I'm like, what, what can I give them as a director? Like, they know so much, they can do so much. Like, I'm just gonna get in their way. Like, ha, ha, I don't know if you have any feelings like that sometimes when you're working with great actors and how do you how do you how do you approach that and how do you get beyond that um, feeling if I, think you I think you think about it like you especially if it's you, something you wrote or something that you've been involved in from the script writing process you have information and knowledge especially of not just what that character is doing but how that character ties into the uh, ties into the you know entire journey of the story that you're, you're making so there's information you have things to bring to the table and even if you're saying things that sometimes you know you feel like they're not you are not useful and I'll sometimes tell an actor like, I don't know if this is useful you know especially early on I'll be like look I don't know if this is useful but this is everything I've thought about this person prior to introducing him to you or her to you here do with it what you choose you know, um, and just recognizing that it's a collaboration, but you have things to share and you don't, and ultimately they will determine whether it's useful or not. So it's not for you to determine whether it's useful. It's for their to them to determine that it's useful. And, you know, don't be afraid to look stupid, you know, um, or, or be corrected, you know, um, you know, some actors, I've been very blessed to not ever encounter an actor who is disrespectful, but I've heard stories about actors who revel in belittling directors, you know? Um, and when I've spoken to directors about how they navigated that process, they just completely subdued their ego and for the betterment of the project and you know, just kind of ate it, which is rough. I, I, I don't know what that must feel like, you know, um, because you also have to balance just the vibration of the entire creative experience for all of those people involved and it can lead to a toxic environment. So it's very, I don't know. I don't know how people would, would, would engage with an actor, you know, a powerful person, you know, a person really, you know, who, who probably doesn't feel powerful, but because of that is, is, is acting that way. Of course, I've never had to deal with that. And otherwise it's just, 
you know, allowing yourself to be vulnerable, <clears throat> but also remembering you have things that, you know. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a question about if you have any advice for people with writer's block, if you face that or you have ways to work through it. Sit in the chair. Um, uh, who are your people when you think about collaborators going forward? Um, how do you gather your crew? You know, I, I mean, if I have great experience with somebody, I, you know, if, if they feel right for the project, bring them back. Mm -hmm. um, and then otherwise, it's in terms of finding new people, it's just in, intuition and, and feeling mm -hmm. a vibration. There's a follow-up. And obviously, past work they've done. Okay. There's a follow-up to the question about Fred Hampton's family. They were on set while you were shooting for a lot of it. Um, did that affect, did that change things in the moment um, in the filmmaking? All the time. All the time. All the time. You know, uh, they'd, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. would see something that, you know, he wasn't comfortable with, would let us know. And, you know, we would try to accommodate that change. And if we could, we would. And if we couldn't, we'd have to tell him we couldn't. And he'd have to deal with that, you know, emotionally. It was constant negotiation process. Mm -hmm. Was that tough or was that great or both? So incredibly tough. But it yielded things off, you know, decisions that often were better than the original choice that we were looking to make. Okay. Um, someone wants to know how growing up in Brooklyn influenced you as a, as a creative person, as an artist. I think in so many ways, it's not even funny. Uh, I think, you know, I think I have a strong sort of sense of good dialogue from growing up in a, in a city where, you know, um, oral communication is, you know, currency. You know, I think New York has influenced me just, you know, the amount of style, the, the prioritization of style that New Yorkers kind of innately have, I think has been an influence and a hindrance at times in my filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, in, in every way. Uh, three guests at a dinner party, living or dead? No idea. Okay. Miles Davis, I don't know. <laughs> people I probably wouldn't even want to hang out with at a dinner party. You know what I mean? People who probably wouldn't have anything interesting to say who like, you know, I love the work that they do and I would never want to hang out with them ever. <laughs> How did you finance your first film? My, one of my producers put up the bulk of the money and then he got uh, financiers from, you know, his own personal connections. Okay. I, this is not me speaking. I can tell no. you're some sort of an introvert. Does filmmaking play a hand in expressing yourself? Um, yes. Uh, is there anyone uh, that you have not yet that you'd like to work with? A million people. Anyone that comes to mind that you might want to tap for your next project? I mean, I don't know that, you know, the next project, it all depends on the roles and whether the, you know, the match makes sense. But there's a million actors and actresses I want to work with. A million. No shortage. Don Cheadle, Delroy Lindo, Iola Davis, Benicio Del Toro. You know, I mean, there's a million, there's a million actors and actresses who are, are just are incredible, you know. Yeah. What, what, what do you think of other films that came out this year that had similar themes? What were your thoughts on Trial of the Chicago 7, for example? I feel like those movies, had, I feel like they didn't have similar themes, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Trial of Chicago 7, I think, is a very different movie than um and a very different you know very different perspective very different um they were very different thematically they, they were made with a completely different politic you know and and I, I think yeah i don't think that there was one film this year that i saw that i was like oh that's like our movie but i think because there, there were a number of movies that you know 
touched on and focused on themes around social justice, you know, or, or had um, revolutionary figures within them uh, that they a lot of times got lumped together. Mm -hmm. What, what, uh, someone wants to know what brings you joy. Oh man, so many things. Laughter, laughing brings me joy. Um, you know, solitude brings me joy. Nature, music brings me joy. A million things. Um, someone who knows you from you, you directed them on high maintenance. They want to congratulate you and they want to know if you would ever direct television again. Someday I'll direct television again, but I want to make some more movies first. I can tell them I said thank you. Well, I can tell them thank you. Hey, Shaka. Congratulations. Hey. Hi. Thanks, Nick. What's up, Nick? It's been a while. I remember, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. In the grocery, in the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. Rap music. Um, uh, it, there seems to be a track that they put filmmakers on where if you are in some way anointed by Sundance, then you get to direct some television. And there's- Oh, that's the, the track? That's, that's the track. <laughs> that's the track, huh? Um, I, know, I'm I didn't know that was the track. <laughs> I'm wondering if you feel like uh, you're able to make the movies you want to make um, within <laughs> the studio system. First of all, that was just not the track. <laughs> Let me just- I'm not saying the track say that you I'm, I'm saying the track that the industry does. Um, I know, but it's not even the track. That's the thing. I mean, maybe it is now, but it wasn't when I, I went because I made, I made Newlyweeds, and I did not direct TV. Okay. I had to go back. I had to go back again with Moulinians, and then I just got lucky that my friend Chris Goodwin, who's now my friend, I didn't know. He just saw it, and he was like, "Yo, I like this. I'm gonna send it to some people I work with in LA at Adult Swim. And send it to this guy, some guys at Adult Swim who needed not even a pilot. They needed a pilot presentation." So they were like, we'll pay you $10,000, which is way less than you'd have to pay a union director to shoot this half hour piece that we're hoping will get made and something. And I just had that as a sample that later when, you know, my agent was being pitched for an, another client of his and that client was busy. He was like, I got this other guy who's done no TV, but he did this little pilot presentation you interested? And that was how I got my first TV. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's just not a track. But, um, or maybe, you know, like I said, it wasn't for me. I just always, especially because I thought it was the track. You know what I mean? Like I went to Sundance and New Orleans and I was like, okay, so now my career begins. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't, didn't pan out that way. So I always just like remind people like it's, that, that's not, don't believe that lie because it's not true. Um, and in terms of how I navigate making studio, was that the question? How I navigate? Are you able to make studio? the films you want to make within the given constraints? I love *Judas and the Black Messiah*. That was the movie I wanted to make. You know, the first version of that movie that I wanted to make. If I go back and I read that script, the things that are missing from the movie, that you know, it would have been nice to see in the in a movie of that scope. They would have never made them in there because they would not have entertained anyone. They would have just been factoids that I would have wanted there for the historical record to, for my own ego, not because they would actually make people connect to the film anymore. You know, the experience of working with the studio, you know, they basically helped me make the most commercial version of the movie I wanted to make. And I had aspirations to get this movie to as many people as possible. And they enabled me to do that, not just through the distribution methods, but, but creatively. They made it, they helped me make it palatable. Um, and ultimately, like, it was my decision whether to make certain choices or not make certain choices, you know. And sometimes there were choices that I had to make, but I found a way to make them where I was comfortable making them, you know. And, and I think that that, it's, it, it, I, I mean, sometimes things are a matter of, you know, sometimes things are dichotomous and sometimes it's a matter of perspective. Um, and, you know, I have, I think, a very healthy perspective on how I want to engage with studio filmmaking.
Okay. There's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of students on here or people that are trying to get their things going and wondering people coming out of college, people coming out of film school, any any advice for way into the industry or just way into making your work? I always think the priority is figuring out what makes and it's not even so much figuring out what makes you special because I have never even really thought I, I have a kind of sense in some ways of what um you know quote unquote my style right like I, I can kind of see what sort of things are in my wheelhouse um but I more so I'm very clear on when I can intuitively feel excitement for something and something that I can invest and give my all in and I can make personal and mine and that no one else could make the way I could make it. And I think tapping into that is, is above all the most important thing as an artist, because once you do that, then it's a, once, then you start making things that feel singular. And I think when something has is singular, then you can find monetary value for it, you know, because ultimately you're talking about art and commerce. So it's just like focus instead of focusing. I think a lot of times when people think about the industry, they focus on how they can make stuff that's accessible. It's actually the opposite of what you should be focusing on. You should focus on how can I make something singular because then it has value. Mm -hmm. There's, I don't, I'm, I don't remember the quote exactly, but there's this idea that the more specific, the more universal. Something exactly. Like Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the time and I don't want to monopolize the rest of your night. There's so many good questions. Thanks everyone um, for, 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 for coming out for this and making this special. Um, uh, a lot of these questions you can Google, someone's reminding. Um, Shaka's done a million interviews. He's going to do a million more. Looking forward no, to- No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, looking, looking forward to your, uh, your next- first. Your next project. Over. Um, you'll make Thank more you. movies Thank and, we'll, and we'll appreciate Thanks. them. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. Um, Thanks, Ben. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a good night. All, right. All the best. Take care.